Good morning. It is 9.58 a.m. on Tuesday, May 29th, 2018. I'm Christiana Ellis, and I just got up. This is five more minutes. I would usually be doing my rewatches on Sunday, but because Balticon was this, this past Sunday, I'm doing it now. So, continuing our rewatch of The Melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya with and the episode titled... The Melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya, Part 1. Now, as we discussed last week in the first episode of this rewatch, uh, the episode order for this show is a little bit unusual because there was a broadcast order and then there's a chronological order. And it's all a little bit complicated because there was a second broadcast order when se Season 2 came out. And it's all kind of a mess. Um, I don't think there's necessarily a, a bad way. Like if you look up online, there's all sorts of different suggested viewing orders. Um, I will basically <laughs> give everyone, uh, I am starting season one and I'm going to be watching it in the season one broadcast order. If you want to look that up and watch ahead, that's the order that I'm planning to do this rewatch in. Um, uh, just because I think th that's how I first saw it. And I think that, that uh, I want to stay with that. And I think there's some pacing things that are beneficial in that order. But last time, the first episode that we did for this rewatch was the, you know, the, Advem the Adventures of Mikuru Asahina Episode Zero, which is an unusual introduction to this series because it is very non-representative. It is not... An episode that really is the real show it is the characters from the real show having made a student film and it is the episode is their student film and I think that's kind of a fun way to introduce even if it's weird however this episode the melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya part one is the first sort of real regular episode and uh, chronologically takes place much earlier and so First and foremost, what this episode does is introduce us to the two primary characters that were not really seen very much in the student film because they were behind the camera. Uh, the director, uh, Haruhi Suzumiya, and the cameraman editor, uh, Kion. So, uh, we begin this episode. Um, voiceover from Kion, in some ways similar to the other uh, you know, the student film they made. But now we start with the, everything's kind of in grayscale, a little film grainy. It's a little, treated a little bit like it's a, a memory. We see Kion, uh, just a young man who's entering high school uh, in a school uniform, and he's walking up a big long hill to school while he gives us this narration. <clears throat> and what he talks about is the idea that Although he never believed in things like Santa Claus, he did actually believe in things like aliens and time travelers. And espers is a term this series uses a lot. If you're not familiar with it, it's basically to mean someone who has like psychic powers of some kind. Um, often uh, psychic powers eat, that go beyond just things like reading your mind or telepathy, but, uh, but like, you know, uh, psychic blasts and stuff like that. But in any event, he talks about how he had believed in those things for longer than most people, partly because maybe he just kind of wished that they were real. But as things stand now, as we have him at the time of this voiceover, he's basically saying, but you grow up, you accept that these things aren't real, and you just content yourself with living in the real world. But then... <clears throat> As he is in his classroom, the girl behind him, when it's time for her introduction, basically says, I'm not interested in any normal people, but if you're an alien time traveler or esper, come see me. And this is basically the statement that she uses to introduce herself to her new high school classmates on the first day of school. And then as Kion turns to look at her, that is where the episode becomes full color and loses the film grain. And I think that that's a fantastic little visual trick 
that this series actually uh, is is very good with uh, those sorts of things because what it conveys in a sense is this feeling that somehow things were less real until she shows up at which things point things become kind of fully realized and uh, I think that that's exciting for reasons that are going to become more clear as the series progresses but just evoking that from the beginning um, at the very least even from this episode we understand we have just met Haruhi Suzumiya her name is in the title it's probably meaningful that we're essentially saying now that she's shown up the story will begin right so even though Kion is our point of view character so to speak it's made very clear that Haruhi is perhaps the the uh, the subject of the story you know in a real way but in any event Kion uh, learns over the course of the next few weeks at school that Haruhi is an odd duck so to speak um, we meet two he meets two friends um, they're not their names aren't given in the episode but they are Taniguchi and Kunikita these are the two boys that uh, uh, Kion has lunch with and talks with and makes friends with and uh, you know we're told one of them is a new friend one of them went with uh, to the same junior high as Kion <clears throat> but it's also interesting we recognize them as uh, two of the supporting characters from the student film in the previous episode uh, that uh, were mind controlled at one point. Um, uh, we don't actually meet the other girl that was uh, uh, in that student movie a couple of times. Miss Tsuruya, I was, I believe, is the the name uh, that we were given in that one, the one that couldn't stop laughing. We don't actually see her in this episode. Um, but we also meet a couple of other secondary classmates, like uh, we also meet um, Ryoko Asakura, who is the the girl who seems like she's, she's sort of a class president type. And she, once Kion starts talking more with uh, Haruhi, you know, inquires to him about like, well, how did you get her to open up? Because I've been worried about her. And we don't really see much uh, else from that girl. Um, you know, so we're, we're not given necessarily any reason that she's going to be a broader character, except, of course, that the episode draws our attention to her in a couple of places. In particular, one of uh, Kion's friends is specifically, he's really interested in her, has a crush on her, and, it, you know, implies to Kion once, he's like, oh, she talked to you, you got to get me in there, man, um, that sort of thing. Uh, but we learn... You know, the focus of the episode early on here is Kion essentially saying, who is this weird girl that sits behind him in class? She introduced herself super strange, and there's something about her. What's going on? And so his friend who went to junior high with her fills him in. She's super weird. She's always been standoffish for normal people. Uh, she's always doing things like you know, borrowing the lane, the line painter for athletic fields and painting weird drawings out in the school in the middle of the night. She, you know, one day that she painted a star on the roof. One day she pushed all the cl the desks out of the classroom, and she's always just doing weird things. And one of the things that he mentions also is that she never says no to any boy who asks her out, but then she inevitably dumps them for being too ordinary including it's funny because he mentions it as a there was one guy who uh you know only lasted five minutes and then it's kind of subtly revealed oh it's him telling the story that that's who it was and uh and so she's obviously very strange and everyone who kind of knows about her is telling kion just you know forget it if you're interested in her just forget it she's too weird and Kion himself notices a couple of things about her. For one, uh, she changes her hair style every single day in a kind of pattern. She starts joining every single club in the school, but quitting each one in series. And she's just 
you know, she's weird and he can't, kind of can't stop thinking about her even as he tells us in the voiceover narration that he was not thinking about her that much. But then he decides one day, randomly, to ask her about how he has noticed her, you know, her hairstyle pattern. You know, he's like, is, is it because it wards off aliens or something? And she's surprised that he noticed and actually engages him in conversation a little bit. And even though she's still kind of aloof and abrupt, uh, she stares at him at a point. And there's kind of this staring thing. And she's, she's clearly paying attention to him in a way that she usually doesn't to anyone else. And, and asks him, like, did, did we know each other before? And, you know, he doesn't know. But... Uh, the next morning, she has cut off all of her long hair and now has a short shoulder-length hairstyle. And so that's unsettling for Kion because he had not expected his conversation to have such an obvious dramatic result. I mean, she obviously had be previously been putting a lot of time and effort into this patterned styling of her hair. And now it's just, she changed it all just the day after he had this conversation. That's hard to know what that might mean. But he finds himself just increasingly having these little conversations with her, even though he's still kind of uncomfortable about the whole thing. So when the class is switching desk orders, he's relieved at this idea that he's not going to be sitting in front of her anymore. And then it turns out by sheer coincidence that she ends up sitting behind him again in what should have been random. And uh, it's, uh, you know, as, as of now, we don't have any indication that there's anything other than coincidence. But, you know, so he's continuing these conversations and, and it's, it's revealed that, you know, the reason she's joining and quitting all of these clubs is essentially kind of like with her introduction, she is essentially trying to find aliens, time travelers, espers, or whatever, and trying to essentially make life be like these sorts of escapist fiction stories, because that's more interesting. Like, she talks about the reason that she always is willing to date anyone, but then rejects them as soon as she figures out for sure that they're just an ordinary human. Um, because, and he's like, well, what's wrong with being human? Why do they have to be an alien or whatever? And she basically just says, because it's more interesting that way. And she expresses that she's bored. She talks about like like the mystery club has never had an actual case. The the you know the paranormal investigation club is just a bunch of people who are like obsessed with the occult. And Kion is taking the more sort of rational, reasonable opinion, uh, you know, position of just saying, well, I mean, what do you expect? And it's interesting because he's talking to her about this idea of. Well, of course those things aren't real. We just have to be content with that. But we know from his opening narration that this was something that he held on to the belief for those things for a long time and that he is perhaps not completely at peace with the conclusion that they aren't real. Um, even if he says he is, he, st he still thinks about it a lot. And I think it's obvious that that's part of what fascinates him about Haruhi is that she has steadfastly refused to give up the belief in those things, even in the face of all the evidence that they're not real. But here's where we have the fateful conversation, which is that uh, uh, she's talking about how none of the other clubs are any good at what she's looking for. And he kind of talks a little bit about how ordinary people have to accept an ordinary life. And it's only the people who, you know, the people who can't uh, accept that are the ones who invent things like planes or computers and, and drive the world's progress forward because they, they looked at what already existed and weren't satisfied with it. And so they made it happen through force of will. And he kind of says it in uh, a phrasing that suggests but we're ordinary, so we have to be content with being ordinary. And it's a, it's an interesting just because it's a little bit of an sort of an under underachievement sort of 
concept. And we can also imagine that maybe even Kion himself is, he's telling himself that a little bit, right? But he tells Haruhi that, and then that sparks, of course, she's going to make her own club. And she comes to this conclusion very loudly in the middle of class. Um, <laughs> and, uh, she, and, it's, and it's once again an example of she really could care less what any of those other classmates or teachers think. Uh, it does not even occur to her until he points it out. Oh, well, maybe we shouldn't have this conversation in the middle of class. But so this is where we're, you know, she's, she drags him by the tie and essentially orders him to help her make this club. And what's interesting throughout all of this is that even though it's definitely framed as she's extremely aggressive in her uh, uh, will to make these things happen and she, you know, dragging him around by the tie, ordering him, commanding him around, but he never really refuses. I mean, in theory, he could, right? Like, he could just say no, like, no, I'm not going to do that. But he kind of retains this sort of uh, aloof willingness to complain about it in his voiceover, and yet he does what she says. And so he she tells him okay you know find out what we need to do to make it an official club she'll take care of getting members and a place to meet and sure enough she has selected a classroom that used to be belong to the literary club and then she is she begins by saying uh, and there are no more members because all the senior members quit um you know graduated there is a freshman member but that's fine it doesn't matter. We'll just take over the classroom anyway. And here's where we meet again, Yuki Nagato, who in the student film from the previous episode was the alien witch uh, who spoke in a very, you know, didn't move much, spoke in a very sort of quiet monotone. And we discover, oh, that's what she's like really <laughs> in regular time, regular life too. She is not, um, she wasn't acting that way. That's apparently how she talks. And Kyon's incredulity that she is okay with the idea that Haruhi's club will meet there uh, is kind of fun because she's just sitting by the window reading a book. And we'll get in a minute to the uh, the books that she's reading. But uh, the she basically just says, no, it's fine. You Well, you know, it's it, not even like I just did it. It's just like, it's fine. No problem. And so uh, apparently, according to Haruhi, she's a member of the new club now because she comes with the room, essentially. And uh, so we are now introduced to one of the other three main characters that were in the student film, right? The next one is Mikuru Asahina, you know, the star of the student film, who we see uh, brought into this club essentially because Haruhi more or less literally kidnaps her. She even describes it as, it took me forever to chase her down. And as she's brought in, she's crying like, where am I? Who are you people? And Haruhi locks the door and it's pretty fun there. And we discover she is that same sort of very timid, um, uh, you know, demeanor. And Haruhi explicitly says, the reason I grabbed her is because, you know, in the dubbed version, I, it, she says, quote, because she's a total little cutie and introduces the concept of moe, which is uh, uh, M-O-E, if you're looking for the English spelling. And that's a concept that shows up in a lot of anime and manga. And it's basically refers to the idea that um, uh, Mikuru is very cute, plays is kind of helpless. Um, but essentially like you want to take care of her and that sort of thing. And essentially Haruhi says, all the stories that have the things that I want also have a Moe girl in it. So it's clear that we need one in order to attract that type of story. And we get, an, an, you know, and increasingly just says, yeah, you're going to be a part of our club now. Are you in any other clubs? Calli calli calligraphy? Oh, you'll quit that. 
And it's uh, we get another interesting moment where it feels a little bit like, wait, something more is happening here. Because even as Makuru is still acting more or less like she's been kidnapped and imprisoned, when she looks over and sees Yuki reading by the window, the episode brings our attention to her realization. We see her eyes go wide. We hear a little bell in the soundtrack. And, and she, then she says, oh, I see. And Kion in the voiceover is like, what? What, what do you mean? What, what do you understand? And so something we can tell as viewers, something's happened there. She recognizes Yuki in some way. Something happened. And after that, she basically says, okay, I will join the club. What's going on there? That's a little bit weird, right? But the fact that this is a club where Haruhi will essentially bully her into doing all sorts of things, grope her breasts, uh, all of these sorts of things are um, uh, set up essentially for Kion to feel protective of this Moe sweetheart um, under the the brutal regime of Haruhi Suzumiya. And uh, that's pretty much... Uh, brings us up to the climax of the episode where Haruhi de declares that the club's name will be the SOS Brigade, which, you know, we got a little bit of uh, English-Japanese combo happening there, but it basically stands for spreading excitement all over the world with Haruhi Suzumiya's brigade. And Kion even, you know, points out that, like, why is it brigade instead of club? And that's brushed aside. So we did not meet in this episode Itsuki who was one of you know the other character from the student film so we haven't met him yet uh, but now we have you know two of the others and obviously we see in the end credits that there's a group of five right there's Haruhi, Kion, Yuki, Mikuru and Itsuki which we haven't met yet but we presumably will right um but uh you know, so that's that's sort of the plot synopsis of this episode. It's very much things are beginning, but we are given this sense that it's like fate. Kion talks about it like it was fate, like the the random little detail that had him first decide to talk to Haruhi and then to mention the idea that if the sort of club you're looking for doesn't exist, you make it. And thus things begin so a few little other random details that I wanted to mention is, uh, one, I love both the opening and closing credit sequences to this show. Um, the last episode had the, um, you know, the clo same closing credits, but this is the episode that has the proper opening credits. Um, because, of course, The Adventures of Mikuru Asahina had its own opening credits, you know, come on, dance now. Uh... But both of these credit sequences, I think, are really wonderful. Um, in addition to being a fun song um, playing over it, there's just lots of fun stuff going on. Uh, when I went to uh, Worldcon in 2006, which was in Japan, which is like right when this came out and when I was watching it, um, they actually had a workshop to learn how to do the dance from the end credits. And so that was kind of fun. But like, I, you know, I couldn't replicate it now. But uh, I think that those are, are great, and I, I think it's a lot of fun. And I think one of the things that attracts me to this show, even though as things stand at this point, uh, there's you, I think you could, if you're watching it for the first time, you'll certainly realize, well, something bigger than what we have seen so far seems to be going on. It's obviously themed around aliens, time travelers, and espers, because, of course, the student film was all about those things. But it's also fun to recognize now that the student film that Haruhi is directing and probably wrote um, is all about those things too, right? <laughs> um, but something more is going on. We get these little clues here and there. Something more is happening. Um, the, I mentioned earlier the title of the, uh, you know, the, the book that Yuki was reading. And this is a bit of a little random trivia because you wouldn't really be expected to recognize this when you're watching unless you're the sort that pours over it. But if you look up trivia things on the internet, she's reading The Fall of Hyperion by Dan Simmons, which if you look at the Wikipedia synopsis is 
Uh, set in the 29th century, the no novel documents a pilgrimage to the planet Hyperion undertaken by eight people whose lives have been altered due to events regarding that world. The pilgrims intend to travel to the Valley of the Time Tombs, where the Shrike, a metallic creature, alleges to grant one wish to the members of a pilgrimage dwells. Uh, each of the seven adult pilgrims has a wish that, if granted, could change the future drastically, and the events that the pilgrims experience on Hyperion could have major influences on their society, creating additional issues. So, we'll leave that where it is for now, but it is a fun bit of trivia. So, if you're re-watching this, like me, um, you'll recognize why that particular book is kind of amusing for that to be what she's reading. And in any case, uh, I think we'll leave it there for now. But so the next episode that we will be watching uh, should be um, The Melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya Part 2. And uh, it took me, I had to hesitate there just a little bit because um, uh, there, there are six Melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya Part 1, Part 2, Part 3, Part 4, and so on. But we're not going to be watching those all in a sequence. There's going to be episodes that show up in the middle of that in the episode order we're doing. But we are watching Part 2 next week. Uh, we'll be back on Sunday. So uh, with that said, I will uh, we'll watch that episode next week on Sunday. And in the meantime, I will talk to you tomorrow for five more minutes. <laughs>